Okay, so we are talking about the first battle, which is Beowulf versus Grendel. Juxtaposition is to take two things and put them side by side. And in learning more about one, it sheds light on the other. And next week um, with the second battle, we'll look at the theme of dichotomy when these are opposites and how that really affects the understanding. But we do have this juxtaposition that opens battle one with Beowulf, um, which is these conflicting images of the setting. So opening lines two through four. In the darkness, growled in pain, impatient, as day after day, the music rang loud in the hall, the harps rejoicing. And so we have this image of Herat and there's music, um, it's loud, there's harps, there's rejoicing, lots of positive imagery. And then directly juxtaposed to that, we have this evil that is Grendel in darkness, impatient, growling in pain. And so what this does is that it opens the narrative, framing it for a much larger conflict, which is the purpose of this writing. Looking at good versus evil, or even the favored versus the unfavored by God. In this greater society, Grendel is outcasted. He cannot participate in this communal celebration. Does this evoke sympathy from the reader? Um, in what ways does the author try to prevent that reader response? And we're gonna think about this again far in the future when we read Frankenstein and we have this hideous murdering monster that you will find yourself questioning if you feel sympathy for him. But I don't think it really happens here with Grendel, right? And one convention put into place to prevent that is even though Grendel is villainized, he's never really described in any kind of tangible way. So if you were to Google images of Grendel, they could greatly differ because there's only a few tangible images as far as like the large arm and the claws that are necessary to describe the, fate, um, the fight scene. But he's not humanized in any way. He's left as this very um, mythological or just more the image of evil than anything that we could really define and potentially sympathize with. So we roll into the biblical story of creation at the very beginning of this narrative um, in which we see the heavy hand of the Christian influence. It shows that evil existed before man, which supports the idea that man alone cannot conquer it, even one with superhuman strength, such as Beowulf. This immediate description of God's creation further juxtaposes Grendel or, or, or outcast evil. Um, it is separate from God. It is not of his world. Which of these two worlds will you choose? So lines eight and 11, these beautiful plains marked off by oceans, the corners of the earth were made lovely with trees. Anything relating to God's creations is described as beautiful nature, right? Directly juxtaposed to that, we have Grendel who haunted the moors, the wild marshes. He was spawned and slime. So very opposite images of good, evil, light, dark. Uh, Grendel's lineage is derived as, um, is described as derived from Cain. Why? So one difficulty religions deal with is how to explain the existence of evil. So, and, and even today, right? So how do we have a loving God if that God allows for the poor, the sick, the children to suffer? A common reply to this is found in that juxtaposition um, or religious dichotomy that offers without the suffering, we would not know pleasure. So Paradise Lost, which you read next quarter, um, that is the central question to the entire writing. Is Grendel victimized here though? Is he given the choice of free will? Is he redeemable? He was born into sin um, as we all are according to Christian texts, but in these early writings, he is doomed to that evil. 
The text offers that although evil roams the earth, quote, line 26, spirits and fiends, goblins, monsters, giants, but they're all, all those beings of evil are here because they're descendants from Cain, whose murderous act created that rift among the gods, among God's favor, and all his descendants are doomed to forever oppose, quote, the Lord's will, and again, and again, be defeated, lines 28 through 29. So why? What is the effect of this? Religious scholars have now painted a world in which evil is ever present. Man, by no action of his own, can vanquish it. It is only if you're in God's good graces, as Rothgar is, that you will be protected. Remember the many purposes of these epic tales. And here we see how the story of Beowulf works as a moral tale, one that promotes that only God can protect you from the evil that is always lurking in the shadows of your life. Just like Grendel, who lurks in the marshes outside the very mead hall in which the warriors gather to celebrate and rejoice in their mortal victories. There's an abrupt shift in the narrative after the opening sermon. And what I want you to keep in mind throughout the whole reading of this text is that it is greatly abridged. So when you see these abrupt shifts happening, we just lost a chunk of information. So around lines 33, 34, um, we first meet the men of Herat and listen to the tone. He found them sprawled in sleep suspecting nothing, their dreams undisturbed. So it describes these men in this very innocent tone. This creates another juxtaposition by making Grendel even more evil in comparison to these innocent men. Because lest we not forget, these are warriors who just returned home from battle, meaning they've slaughtered many lives themselves. But next to these sleeping men is um, Grendel described as his greed or his claws snatched up 30 men, smashed them, ran out with their bodies, the blood dripping back to his lair, delighted with his night slaughter. And yet another dichotomous relationship frames the narrative and the men awake from a night of celebrating to mourn the many lives lost and the fear and danger they were in. So why all these oppositional relationships? Remember, ultimately, this is a story of good versus evil, um, but it predates Christianity, right? So what's the moral then? It's pretty grim, right? Um, if you don't believe in an afterlife, as Beowulf and his men would not have, then what is the pay for fighting evil after evil and living in such a dark world? Is it any more than survival and grim reality? We wanna modernize it, right? We wanna give it this happy ever after or at least a lesson learned. Um, but that's just not the reality here for an Anglo-Saxon's life. It's tough and then you die. So all the survivals, survivors of Grendel's attack flee Herat and Grendel rules this vast wasteland for 12 years. Consider the cultural reference here. Um, quote, his misery leaped the seas, was told and sung in all men's ears. So what is immortal in this pagan society? Only these oral tales sung from land to land. Not the story of Grendel's evil, uh, and excuse me, now the story of Grendel's evil has replaced all of those songs of great heroic tales. So what reigns, evil does. Grendel is always lurking at the edges of society. Line 76, lying in wait, hidden in mist, invisibly following them. The message evoked is that evil cannot be avoided. And we, the audience to this, are always vulnerable, 
always helpless. This, of course, is a convenient message for the early biblical scholars to cling to and to proselytize their message of hope. Because in this society, without a God, there is none. Rothgar is, of course, protected from this great evil. And why? Because he is the only Christian in the land, a land filled with heathens that still pray to worthless stone gods. We could pause here and question how great of a leader is Hrothgar if none of his followers have adopted this belief. But more importantly, this is a place to really tease out the friction and try to understand what has been lost in the text translation. To see that Hrothgar is the only person protected is helpful to the Christian translation. But how does that work with the text before that influence? The story most likely originates at a time historically that is this transition to Christianity. So it's not unexpected here that there's this clash between mono and polytheism but the former is definitely favored. Even before, before Christian influenced transcription, um, there's still that favoring in this shift to monotheism, although it may not have the direct biblical um, influence that Beowulf comes to have after translation. But even that we can play with because even though Hrothgar is by far the most favored of God's people in the story, even he cannot defeat Grendel. For Beowulf to be the man of supernatural strength, the only man able to do so, is a little more understandable to the original text. Hrothgar was a good man, a good leader, a Christian man, but this wasn't enough to be an epic hero, you need to display superhero strength against supernatural enemies. And even the invasion of Christianity into the text can't take away from that. There's two problematic lines in this section for me. Um, and the first one is, quote, God whose love Grendel could not know. Who is this God? This is definitely not a God of forgiveness or redemption, which of course is a New Testament God um, and not the one that would have been influencing the text. The second line that gives me pause is that, quote, Hrothgar's heart was bent. So we question why didn't he gain more followers for the religion he practiced, but to me, this infers that he wasn't trying to, that he kind of turned his back on these stone worshiping men of his and kind of left them to do their own thing. So the text breaks into another sermon. Um, this is when we see the heathens pray to the stone gods who cannot protect them. Um, before we break, before we finally introduce Beowulf, right? And there's something meaningful happening, right? Because we're about to introduce this um, human, this mortal who is needed to save them. And so we've got to make sure that we put our audience in the right mindset of God first, then man. So Beowulf is described, lines 110, the strongest of the Geats, lines 111, stronger than anyone anywhere in this world. Um, it said, quote, none of the wise ones regretted his going. Much as he was loved by the Geats, the omens were good. So they did not fear for him. They trusted that he would be victorious. Um, is that weakened by the note of good omens influencing their decision? Does the belief in omens conflict with God's favor that is infused in the text of support the, uh, the root of Beowulf's success. Um, it takes 14 of, quote, the mightiest men, the bravest and best of the Geats in line 120. And why? Why does he need them? Um, are you honored if you're one of these guys? What happens to the protection of your homeland when you take away all of its greatest warriors and protectors? 
Let's think here about what are the traits of an epic hero. Um, so one necessary trait is that he has to gr travel great distance to save his own people who obviously he has. Um, that's not sacrificial, right? That's expected to be an epic hero. Um, you've got to offer protection to a weaker group that will suffer or not survive without this intervention. Anytime as you're reading and you see like an italicized bridge of text, realize that that indicates a very large portion has been removed. And we see this um, most significantly happen on the journey of Beowulf across lands. Um, the original text that is a very lengthy journey filled with um, Beowulf mostly, but also the other 14s each boast of all their great deeds. Um, and also keep in mind that we're spending three weeks on this and we've broken it down to the three battles, which is because that's what your text does. But this is not a trilogy. That, that's a very modern trope, um, very modern. And although that's how we approach the text, that's not how the actual text is. So just keep those in the back of your mind and make sure you're not making assumptions based on the three fights and looking at it as a part one, two, and three. That's just how we've broken it down for discussion. All right, so um, Beowulf arrives and Hrothgar knows who he is, um, which reiterates him as a legend. Beowulf greets Hrothgar with a boast about his great victories. And we need to look differently at the role of bo uh, boasting in this society. Today, we expect humility. Um, you know, we love a hero that shuns pride. We don't give favor to a hero that constantly reminds us of how great he is. That would not have been the same in Anglo-Saxon society because that society is so rooted in fundamental survival that they would favor whoever had the greatest chance of ensuring them that survival. So this is like Beowulf's oral resume. He goes as far as to ask favor to fight Grendel um, to add to that lengthy list of victories. So that is one of the motivations for why he does this. And it is important throughout this narrative to trace his motivation and how it changed. But this is posturing. Um, he is following the expected customs, just like when they left all their weapons on the ship and approached the throne without them. Um, you know, Hrothgar didn't fear being attacked. It is just, um, tradition and customs, you know? Beowulf actually crossed great seas for the very reason to fight Grendel and protect the Danes. Also with these conventions though, we see that Beowulf, although he is the only one with power enough to be victorious in battle against Grendel, he still submits to the power of King Hrothgar. Also note here that we learn of Beowulf's noble lineage. Remember, our epic hero is not going to be a rags to riches story. A noble birth is a trait of an epic hero. There is not this romantic ideal of transcending classes. That's a much more modern trope for heroes. At this time, you are either born into power or you serve those who do. Among Beowulf's boast would be illusions connecting him to other great legends that would have been sung about at the time. And so around line 153, he says, I drove five great giants into chains, chased all that race from the earth. So connecting back to Greek mythology, um, this is referring to the story of Zeus and all his siblings who fight against Typhon and the giants to gain control of the realm. And, and so he is aligning himself with these mythological gods because, you know, he is making himself legendary. There's also, it's so slight that you may have missed it. I actually missed it until I, um, read about it in criticism and then went back to look at the original text. Hrothgar at one time protected Beowulf's father from a pending war. And so 
in the list of Beowulf's motiv uh, motivation for doing this, this is also seen as a repayment to Hrothgar for that favor. Something to keep in mind. So the Danes and Geats, uh, Geats commune together. They celebrate the assured victory over Grendel. After the feast, the Danes leave, and for the first time in 12 years, the men sleep in Hrothgar's hall. Here again, we have this juxtaposition of celebration and mourning, day and night, light and dark, which ultimately all symbolize that great and timeless battle of good versus evil. Um, this convention too, though, again shows this communal society with just one outcast. The creature, quote, bearing God's hatred, sliding silently from his swampland to that gold shining hall. So there is a clear division of God against God. Grendel is surprised to find Herat so well defended. He is delighted to arrive and find so many sleeping warriors awaiting his feast. He's not fearful. He does not doubt his ability to defeat. It says lines 253, his heart laughed when he saw all their bodies. Grendel devours one warrior while Beowulf is described as kind of propped up and watching. How do we feel about this? Is it too casual of a tone? Did this Geet warrior just sacrifice his life for no reason? Beowulf doesn't even try to protect him. Or is this a tactic that shows his mental acuity as well as his physical strength? Is this to show that he studied the enemy and was methodical in his approach? This needs to be considered because we will see his motivations throughout the battle change. So here, he is not rash. He is not easily provoked. Um, and then we have the meeting of Grendel and Beowulf. I mean, what do you guys think? For me, it was pretty anticlimactic. We had this very detailed buildup and then it's kind of over in a flash. So Beowulf goes into this battle with no weaponry. Weapons are worthless against Grendel. If he could have been defeated by weapons, he would have been defeated already. And if Beowulf had greater weapons than ordinary men to go into battle, relying upon it would give victory to that weapon more so than to Beowulf's human hands or superhuman. Because at this point in the narrative, it is he and no weapon that is capable of his victory. He, quote, fastened those claws in his fist until they cracked. And for the first time, we see a fearful Grendel. Line 278, Grendel's one thought was to run from Beowulf, flee back to his marsh and hide there. Grendel wants to run away, but he cannot escape Beowulf's grasp. There's a line here to consider in analyzing Beowulf's motivation as battle, and it's lines 281 to 282. Quote, Higlak's follower remembered his final boast and standing erect stopped the monster's flight. So we can look at the fact that he came to Hrothgar's aid as a repayment for his father's debt. And now we can also look at the fact that he feels obligated to follow through on this promise because he's already boasted that he would. Do either of these facts really matter? Not so much if we look at them through the scope of an Anglo-Saxon society who would have valued such loyalty and sense of obligation. Protecting a weaker people would not have been as valued in the society. So there's this hyperbolic fight scene, great emphasis given on the features to build this kingdom able to withstand any battle, anything but a great fire. So the battle between Beowulf and Grendel causes the great walls with iron bolts in place to shake. Um, lines 308, screams of the Almighty's enemy sang in the darkness, the horrible shrieks of pain and defeat, the tears torn out of Grendel's taut throat and Grendel is defeated. At this point, which really looks like victory is assured, 
Beowulf's men then raise their weapons and protect their leader in battle. It's not until this point that we learn that Grendel has, quote, bewitched all the men's weapons, laid spells that blunted every mortal man's blade. So is Beowulf a great warrior because he lacked the fear to fight without weapons? Because he has a strength to fight without weapons? Or did he know this before the other man figure it out? Either way, it reinforces the idea that he, and why he, um, only he, could defeat, defeat Grendel and do so with his bare hands. Um, at Grendel's death, though, we have this interesting reference to a greater hell where he would go, quote, swept groaning and helpless to the waiting hands of still worse fiends. What is this hell? Who are these fiends? Um, and does this originate from the original tale? Um, maybe the center of the earth where the beast of Greek mythology earlier referenced now reside. Without a belief in the afterlife, does this free man of that evil? Uh, line 331, now he discovered, once the afflictor of men, tormentor of their days, what it meant to feud with Almighty God. What's happening here? Um, is Beowulf presented as a godlike figure, God himself, an agent of God? This is definitely a place where the infusion of Christian translation is evident. Beowulf travels great seas across vast landscapes to battle against Grendel. Only his superhuman strength is able to not only defeat this monster, but do so with his bare hands, a feat that hordes of great warriors and their weaponry combined could not do. That doesn't work too well in a Christian frame there, right? So after the fact, we're going to have a footnote, which is a nod that God favored him to win this battle. And it doesn't create a fluid narrative. As you're reading this, it should have felt a little fragmented because it was like big fight scene, but glory be to God. His bare hands, he ripped them apart, but he was favored by God. And so this is to me of all the places in the text where you see like those monks translating it, really working um, to infuse that, that newfound Christianity into this writing to take glory from mortal man and kind of redirect the purpose of Beowulf's legend. Grendel is defeated. He is not killed. Um, that's a little bit of a foreshadowing there. It is an important detail. It's like the end of the horror movie where like there's a, you know, the, the monster that's been killed kind of blinks an eye or twitches. Grendel will be back. Um, line 342. But as wounded as he could flee to excuse me, as wounded as he was, he could flee to his den, his miserable hole at the bottom of the marsh, only to die, to wait for the end of all his days. Does this make Beowulf a compassionate hero? Because he didn't actually kill him. Um, does he fall in any way by not finishing the deed? Or is it simply a seg for what's to come? The Danes laugh with delight, and there is this big celebration for Beowulf's victory in the Mead Hall beneath the, the crusted, bloody, dirty arm and shoulder that was ripped from Grendel and carried back as his battle trophy. People travel from far lands to see the sights of this legendary battle to trace the bloody path of Grendel's crawl from the Mead Hall to the marsh, which reinforces this cultural idea of oral tales and legends being told across society. This is not just Grendel's story now though, as it was when we began. Now Beowulf's legend continues to grow and he does indeed for now, in a way, become immortal. Because remember, the only afterlife for this Anglo-Saxon society is to become a legend. So these traveling scops now, quote, line 392, weave a net of words for Beowulf 
in their songs of ancient heroes. And keep that in mind because the story is framed in a way that will want to connect back to this at the end. That idea of the importance of legends and songs on great battles to society. All right. That is the end of Beowulf versus Grendel. And we're going to pick up in part two um, when Grendel, the only son of his mother, um, now has a very upset mom coming to seek her revenge.